Welcome to Talent X, the Talent Experience podcast featuring authentic conversations on the future of work, empowering you to better understand and deliver a best in class, future proofed career experience. For more insightful conversations, visit talentxpodcast.com. We hope you enjoy this episode of the Talent X podcast. Hi, I'm Rhonda Taylor. And I'm hosting Talent X today, and today we have a wonderful guest, uh, a friend of mine. We've been in the influencer space. He's a two-time book author. He has his company that is global in clients, and his name, of course, is Jason Larson. Welcome, Jason. Hey, Rhonda. Thanks for having me. Jason, you're well-known in the space. You've spoken at a lot of conferences, but you know what? Give us, let us know who the real Jason well, I don't know if we have time for that. There's too much. I wasn't prepared for uh, that much unpacking, Rhonda. So I'm going to give you the, uh, I'm going to give you the professional, the professional real Jason. How's that? Okay. Um, I, the, the snippet of me is I live like right now I live on uh, what I, what we affectionately refer to as the compound just out, outside of Omaha, Nebraska, kind of right in the middle of everywhere in the U S uh, with my my family, my three kids, from ranging from 23 to 10, so it's it's uh, a lot going on here. Professionally, I spend most of my time thinking about employee engagement, how to help organizations figure out employee engagement, how to help managers be better managers. Um, I have, as you mentioned, I've written a couple books. I do a lot of writing about it. I do a lot of speaking and training around it. Recently, I have been spending most of my time on kind of a new passion project. Um, which is uh, something called the Engagement Leader Community, which is an online learning community that launched recently that uh, is designed for people who are trying to enhance engagement in their organization. It's a way for me to in, like, reach out and touch them and help them in this COVID distributed world that we live in. So that, that's me in a nutshell. Yes, and, and I've heard wonderful things about, the, uh, about your following um, in that engagement program. So listen, um, we've seen a lot. Gosh, you know, four months ago, we had 2.8% on, uh, 2, 2 unemployment. Now, you know, three and a half months later, four months later, we're at 9%. And, you know, you talk to some people and they say it's 30%. Um, big changes have occurred. Um, what are you seeing out there? Well, yeah, you're right. I mean, and the numbers, you know, numbers in the U.S. are are pretty crazy, you know, un, unheard of numbers historically. And, and it's an interesting, it's an interesting time through the lens of employee engagement. Um, there's some really, I think, unusual things going on that on the one hand, you know, you hate to see, um, obviously in my, my empathy meter goes off all the time for the people that are being displaced and that are that want to work and can't find work and all of that because I know they're in a really tough situation. I think that the silver lining of what's happening right now is we're actually seeing, I think, um, a bunch of progress kind of get get broke through. Like there's a, you know, I've, I've, as a executive for 10 years and now working on the outside helping organizations, I've always talked about that, you know, we spend so much time thinking about how to get, especially from an HR lens, how do we get executives to change? How do we get them to change their behavior? How do we get them to open their mind about, you know, changing their ideas about how we work? And I've always said that, you know, there's basically two ways that you see change. You either, you either get a new executive which is often how it happens. It's actually a new person with a new state of mind. You don't actually change their mind. You just get somebody new who gets it or a burning platform. And the, the, when, the, when the floor's on fire, suddenly we get real serious about changing. And I think we've been seeing a lot of that happening recently in organizations um, as they try to adapt uh, through this time. As we've, you know, organizations went from being all co-located to being distributed, through through COVID and everything else. And all of a sudden they're starting to do things that we've been trying to tell them to do that are good for them for years. And, and now they're doing it. They're communicating more regularly with employees. We now have greater flexibility than we've ever had before. We're expressing legitimate care for people 
uh, uh, people's well-being and their family's life. And there were, we're, think, we're building programs to help people manage the complexities of their life. All of these things that, Rhonda, you and I have been talking about for, I, you know, 15, 20 years, that these are important things. We, it's no surprise. We just couldn't move the needle. And then all of a sudden, along comes a virus and boom. Now the floors, you know, the, the platform's on fire. We got to do something. And as a result, we're actually seeing engagement numbers starting to trend up. It's pretty, uh, it's kind of crazy. It doesn't, on some level, it doesn't make sense. And on some, some level, it makes perfect sense. Oh, it, exactly. And, and we have, uh, we've witnessed that ourselves um, in the number of engagements, um, especially like in gig, en gig engagements. Um, they weren't so popular before COVID. And now uh, the number of gig assignments that are out in, in, in an organization are phenomenal. It, you know, it's funny. I think one of the one of the side effects that seems to be taking place that I think is a really positive side effect of not being able to see our people is that it's, you know, in terms of the day-to-day -day management of our organization, when we don't have our people there, we can't see the human being. It actually, I think, is helping us start to step back and not, you know, it, it removes kind of some bias interrupters or some things that get in the way of, of thinking about portability of talent and thinking about how we work and how we can work and how we can flexibly um, build an environment where we, we can actually leverage um, talents and, and abilities in different ways. And I, I would suspect like the gig, uh, that your gig functionality is a perfect example of that. Like when I see somebody sitting here and I know that person is a marketing specialist or an accountant or whatever, I like they're in front of me, I know they do numbers and spreadsheets if they're an accountant, but I may not even be thinking about them for all of these other talents they may have. Whereas when I can't see them, um, now we're reliant on kind of systems to enable and tap into that, that talent and put it to work. I think it's really interesting that, you know, maybe now all of a sudden we're thinking more broadly about talent or we're thinking more broadly about how we can work. I think it's a really positive thing that's going on. And, and, you're, and you're so absolute, absolutely right, because in the past, you know, the gigs and, the, and the, the fun things within an organization that we're around to do were usually um, a, almost like a favor, a tap on the shoulder and say, hey, can you do this? Um, because the supervisor had faith that this exercise would be done. But now people have to go out and, and literally take a look at their remote workforce and said as to who can do this right. and it opens up a whole new level of transparency and that's so valuable for sure and i my hunch is that what we're going to see over time is the organizations that are proactive about that because i can't because i can't sit down with my favorite employee and sort of say hey can you help me with this and then they get to take on this kind of cool assignment. I don't have that conversation as regularly. I don't have that sort of passive flyby that I've got to, I put it out to a broader market. I'm actually probably going to find a better suited talent. And so we start to tackle and tap into or tackle problems by tapping into actually, you know, even better, more highly skilled people potentially, or we're going to see people come to the surface that we were overlooking. And it, it's amazing how much our eyes deceive us when we're in management. And that's one of the things that I think is positive about the distributed workplace is it allows us or forces us to rely on things. It's kind of like a, it makes me think of that, the blind audition story that you get, you know, that you hear gets retold about. And I think it was a symphony somewhere where you know, women were really underrepresented in this in the symphony, and then they put up a screen and started doing blind auditions, and they made them actually come in with bare feet because they that way they couldn't tell you know even the sound of their feet on the on the ground as they walked in who's what kinds of shoes, and all of a sudden once they went to blind auditions, it ended up being like fifty fifty men and women. It was strictly a bias that was built in that men were better 
know, better performers or, or better technical uh, players. I, I think we're going to see that effect, hopefully. I mean, we're going to have to be really careful that we design our technology and use our technology the right way so we don't perpetuate bias and all that sort of thing. But if we do it right, it should open up a whole world of visibility into talent we didn't even know we had. Oh, ex exactly. And, you know, Jason, with, with this COVID, we're hearing people all getting like, you know, all these new words and all these new job descriptions and all of these new action items. And, you know, I think the best one was I heard, you know, somebody has, has the responsibility of training their staff on using Zoom. And I'm like, that's, that's in your job description now? Interesting. You're a Zoom trainer? Right. Um, you know, um, but you know, you have, you have, um, some insight too on certain jobs that are evolving and, and, and you question the validity because, you know, example, I, I think we, we spoke earlier about, uh, managing the remote workforce. Right. Um, what's your view on that position in the future? Sure. I, so one of the things I worry about, I don't worry, I guess I, maybe worry isn't the right word, but it's something that I find interesting, maybe aggravating, maybe troubling. I'm not sure. It's a whole, whole I'm, I'm, I have mixed emotions, Rhonda. That's what I'm trying to say. Mixed emotions about this is, you know, over the last two or three months, you see, you see it discussed. You see managing remote employees discussed as if it's some kind of new skill set or it's some it's like some kind of rocket science that we have to master and figure out and retrain our people and the reality of it is that the reason at least i think this is my opinion is that i think the reality of why remote management is hard is because we suck at management We've been bad at management in a lot of ways for years. We're not very good. That's why I wrote a book about managing performance in a way that actually unlocks performance is because traditionally we've been, we, we have a bunch of management systems that aren't very effective. We've underdeveloped our managers around the things that really matter. And so when you, when you aren't good at, for example, if I have a team I manage in person, and I'm not very good at setting clear expectations. And I'm just sort of managing it, I'm micromanaging it on a day-to-day -day basis. I'm kind of muscling my way through it. I'm, I'm, I'm in my people's business and just course correcting them kind of like, a, like bumpers, you know, like have bumpers on each side of them. And I just keep kind of knocking them back towards the general direction I want them to go. If that's how I've been managing for 30 years and all of a sudden, I have no ability to bumper manage my people anymore. The fact that I suck at managing is now pretty visible and it starts to become a pain point. And so if I've not, if I don't know how to set clear expectations, I don't know how to provide helpful coaching or feedback. I don't know how to have conversations with my people to keep them focused and motivated and encouraged if I've not been doing that and then suddenly and I've been a comma, you know sort of making up for it through weird in-person micromanagement all of a sudden us being at a distance when my people can actively avoid me because they really hate how I manage them things are going to break down and so it's not it's not a matter I don't think of we need a new skill around remote management we just need to own up the fact that we generally have been really poor around developing the kinds of, of management skills we really need. And that's, it's fundamentals. And if we do it well now and we get people doing this well now, then they will be good managers regardless of where people are at. And that's what we need to be thinking about are the fundamentals as opposed to, you know, treating it like it's some completely different set of skills because I don't believe that it is. Sure, sure, there's differences in how you do it, but I don't think it's a different set of skills. Yeah. Well, whether you're, whether you're a manager or an employee, you know, this, this era has opened up a, a great door of opportunity. Um, people are sitting back and Sure. At first, we you know when we all were were in lockdown and like, let's face it, Jason, the world stood still for two weeks. Yep. That's scary. Yep. And we and 
And we sat there trying to figure, figure out, you know, okay, what's happening? You know, there was a little bit of shell shock. But then people went into a move, a move forward, like, how am I going to cope with this? And, and companies stepped up big time. And I, I'm really proud of some of the companies that I know that stepped up. And even though their workforce was remote, they, they gave them skills to handle this era, whether it was professionally or personally. And, and I was just wondering if you saw that. Absolutely. I, I think that there were a lot of, a lot of organizations that, and that kind of goes back to my burning platform thing um, comment earlier is that because the situation was so dire, it, it was like, it was like we had a whole bunch of leaders and organizations. I mean, they've known and they've been inching towards creating a more human workplace. And then finally we were forced into it. Like finally we, we were forced to create like flexibility became like, how do you not be flexible when you had to send everybody home and you weren't prepared for it and they've got their kids there and they're doing school and they're trying to, you know, deal with cohabitating with their spouse and both of you working, like all the stuff they had to deal with that, or you're supporting a frontline essential person that, that has to go to work and now has, you know, the level of safety has gone. Like you had to be flexible. You had to care at a level that you, you know, like you, you knew that if you didn't care, there were literally life and death consequences for the people and the business. And so it forced us into this. And I think there have been a lot of examples of people that, and organizations that did step into it. Uh, what I, what remains to be seen is how sticky it will be. Like, is, have we made real changes that will stay with us for uh, a decade? I think that we have. I think there's been some fundamental shifts. I've, uh, like you have, I've seen a lot of really encouraging thing that, things that I am super hopeful about in terms of, of actual, real, sustainable change. But we're going to have to be diligent about supporting it and encouraging it and getting it built into our processes now because someday when we get to whatever the other, whatever the next thing is after this, if we haven't built this into how we do business, it will be really easy to snap back to old habits. And so I think there's a, there's a real opportunity and a lot of work to do, but I'm, I'm hopeful about where we're headed. Yeah. You know, Jason, I always, I always live in the, I always believe that we live in a world of caring. And I think this COVID has taught us all to care in a big way, to care for each other, to care for our, our, our jobs and our fellow employees and to care for the universe and, and, and the world. Um, and the environment. Um, I, I really hope that, you know, I, I like that saying, we're, we're all in this together. I really hope that that continues. Yeah, I do too. And I, th there's, um, I think there's a big chunk of people that have leaned into that. And I think that, uh, I hope that it stays like you. I hope that it stays with us. I hope it's a sustainable um, a sustainable I mentality, guess, movement, emotion, mentality, yeah, mindset, whatever it yeah. is. But uh, yeah, it's a beautiful thing when you see it in action and you see organizations that are being the kind of employer that we know is possible. And, and my hope is that we will see that the business results are going to follow. And I believe that we're going to, I believe that the, the performance of these organizations over the next few years, the organizations that really leaned into this, that, that were caring at speed and scale during this, that were taking care of their people first, are going to be the ones that are best positioned to not only survive, but thrive in the future. And I really hope we have that story to tell. I do too. And Jason, you know, at Talonex, we strive for all the employees to be, you know, happy and satisfied in their work. You know, what keeps Jason Lawrence happy at what he does at work? Being able to have an impact on the world and on people around me. That's at the end of the day, there's that. 
and the freedom to do the work that really matters. And when I can marry those two things together, um, I am happy. And uh, when I am happy, then generally that means I'm a, I'm a lot easier to live with. So I think that probably means my wife is happy too. And that's ultimately what really matters. So, so that's it for me. Yeah. Jason, I thank you so much for, for joining us on, on Talent X today. Well, thanks for having me. It's always a joy to talk to you, Rhonda. Well, thank you. And this is Rhonda Taylor from Talent X hosting Jason Lawrenson today. Have yourself a great week. Be safe. Remember, we're all in this together. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Talent X podcast. For more talent experience and future of work conversations, visit talentxpodcast.com. Follow us on Twitter at Talent X Podcast. Or join the conversation with hashtag Talent X Podcast on Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, or Twitter. Talent X, the Talent Experience Podcast, was brought to you by the fabulous Fuelies at Fuel 50.